Hello, welcome. Thank you for surviving Dreamforce. Happy to see you all here. My name is Philippe Ozil, and uh, I'm going to be presenting a topic that is really dear to my heart. I'm going to be talking about Lightning Web Components. And I'm going to introduce to you how you can build Lightning Web Components and how you can deploy them anywhere, meaning on and off the Salesforce platform. Before I do so, I have to give you the forward looking statement. You probably had this already a hundred times by now, but we are a publicly traded company, so please make your purchasing decisions based on what is currently available in the product. I will talk about some beta features here, so take this into consideration, please. Now, my session is going to be divided into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to introduce or reintroduce uh, Lightning Web Components, and on the second part, I'll be talking about tooling and methodology. This is going to get way more technical. So let's start with a short introduction to Lightning Web Components. So the, the reason why this all came together was because there was a huge shift in terms of uh, standards on the web. What happened in the past was uh, that web standards started to emerge um, in previous decades, and innovation stalled at some point. And you can see this on, on this graph here. Uh, and even before 2000, there was no innovation at some point. There were different uh, standard bodies and companies who were competing to get their standards out, and there was nothing that was agreed upon. But there was a huge shift change in about 2014. 2014. At that time, um, there was a revival of the standards, so a lot of bodies came together and regrouped and reformed those consortium, the ones that you can see on the screen, the, the W3C and the TC39, which is dedicated to JavaScript, the browser APIs, and this stuff. And so what changed fundamentally here is that we saw a huge um, agreement between the key players of the web to build new standards, and this really changed a lot um, in terms of innovation. With that, this is the best time to be a web, a web developer because there are a lot of standards. This means that you have, you have the ability to have transferable skills. If you work on a given technology, you can apply the same technology to other projects. So maybe you learn one day React, but you can learn the next day View, or maybe you can learn also Lightning Components. All of these are tied together because they're all standard. And the good thing is that if you know how to do JavaScript, you're gonna apply these skills to different uh, projects, and you're gonna also be able to use the same tooling. For testing, for example, you use the same libraries, whether it's different frameworks. And we're gonna see that in, later on as I talk about tooling. Same thing for um, standards. When you use standard elements like Web Components, you can take them and you can apply them to different projects. Now, another thing that is also uh, not often mentioned is that performance by having standard code is way, way better than actually having all of the um, logic to simulate both standards. Take something like uh, the original uh, Angular. The original Angular or jQuery, these were actually complementing browsers by, uh, by recreating some logic that should have been shipped as a standard thing. For example, the templating engines, these are all created by frameworks at first. But nowadays, these are part of standards, so they're running natively in the browser code. This is not JavaScript. This is why we have better performance. Now, this allowed us to create this new uh, framework for Lightning Web Components. And you see in 2014, in the blue square, uh, all, all these things were done with framework abstractions. For example, the templating, the re-rendering of the components, all of that was done with JavaScript. And this was actually very not efficient because JavaScript code is slower than native code that runs in the browser. So with this change of, uh, of landscape but between 2014 and now, uh, there were a lot of things that changed. The few standards that were agreed upon at that time have really drastically improved, and now we have a huge range of features that we can leverage that are built in the browsers and also behave the same across all different browsers. So we were able to leverage things like web components, decorators, templates, modules, all of that which is part of uh, ECMAScript 7 or ES6. With that, we were able to add a little layer here that is called Lightning Web Components. Now, Lightning Web Components focuses on all the key uh, certain features that have high added value, like the integration with the Salesforce platform, for example. It provides security also, but it's something that is not natively implemented in the browsers. And we connect it with our platform by providing a data service. So what does this mean? This means that this framework has the goal to disappear, actually. And that is actually a very strong statement. I'm quoting the Lightning Web Components architect. The idea behind Lightning Web Components is that it's just a layer to bring every browser to the same level. But as standard evolves, and, and as uh, people move away from older browsers like IE11, we will all be on the same level. And in the end, the abstractions layer that are still here in Lightning Web Components will slowly fade, and we will just be the standard that is Web Components. So, Take an, take an example, talking again about IE11. IE11 does not support all the standards yet, 
So the, the, the way it works right now with our network components is that we uh, do something called polyfilling, and we are actually replacing certain fun functionalities of the frameworks of these of the standards by implementing in JavaScript. This is not so performant, but this is actually completely modular, and it can be detached from Lightning Web Component Framework as the standard is deployed everywhere on every browser. So really, that's the key idea here, is that at some point, the framework will not grow. It will rather shrink for better performance and even more standards. Now, we are following a pattern. This is not, we're not really new. The rise of Lightning Web Components is pretty similar to what we have uh, with Lightning Components, previously known as Aura. The idea is that we have an open source framework that is available everywhere, and we have a middle layer of platform integration that ties it very to the Salesforce platform. Now, if you take aside this platform integration layer, you have the open source framework that you can use and can build uh, out of the platform. The idea with the platform integration is that you get access to a whole range of services that you don't have to re-implement, things like the data service, the base component, or the security like Locker service. And so there's also another thing that is really different if you take a comparison with Aura. Aura was pretty ambitious. At that time, there were no standards. We had to reinvent the wheel, like reinventing all the templating engine, all of that. But we, we made a really different choice in terms of architecture. This Aura framework was tied to the back end. So Aura was running with a Java server behind it. With Lightning Web Components, we took a really different approach. We took an approach in which we are completely agnostic of the back end that is running. So, Lightning Web Components can actually run with PHP, can run with uh, Java, with any backend, doesn't matter. It's not tied to the to backend. It's purely front, it's purely native in the browser. And this means a lot. Now, I'm gonna talk more about the tooling, the methodology, and we're gonna see comparing the on and off platform of Lightning Web Components. So let's start first by how do we create a new project? I'm gonna compare how you do that on the platform or outside of the platform. If you're running on platform, you will need Salesforce DX to work with uh, Lightning Web Components. So for those of you who may be new to Lightning Web Components, uh, and you were used to develop, um, to developing on Aura or, or Visual Force, the tooling is a bit different here. Uh, for example, you do not have access to the developer console when you're doing Lightning Web Components. You have to use an external tool. The one we recommend is the Visual Studio Code with the Salesforce DX extensions, but there are other uh, platforms you can use. The key idea here is that you're gonna work with the metadata API and that's the Salesforce DX project does that for you. It will create the right framework and now you push and pull your project onto scratch org or even production orgs. Now, there is one thing that is really different uh, compared to a traditional, um, a traditional uh, Salesforce DX project is that you can add also a configuration for Node.js um, to, your, to your Salesforce DX project. And the reason why we do that, I'm gonna cover that in the next slides, is that you can have some um, dependency and some uh, code checking actually running on your local machine uh, that will help you to write better code. And I'll explain if, um, how this works with a couple of examples. Now, let's take the other side of the, um, of the equation. When you're off platform, you actually use a Node.js project from the start. This is something we, we keep, we're providing out of the box. You could run your own server with something else, but the tooling that we provide is running on Node.js. This is giving you the, the, um, the right configuration and the right setup. And in particular, the uh, tool called LWC Create App is something called a scaffolding project. So scaffolding project basically is an interactive script that will guide you through the setup of your project and it's very efficient. And I will show you that uh, in a second. So in both environments, let's consider that we're running on Node.js. There are certain things that are, uh, that are gonna be different whether you're on or off platform. First of all, when you're on platform, you don't use Node.js to deploy and run your code. This is just here to help you for development uh, work. So you have two types of dependencies, essentially, with uh, Node.js. You have the runtime dependencies, which help you to deploy and run your project, or you have development dependencies, for example, the tests. You're not running your tests in production, so they're only staying in a test environment. With, with on-platform, uh, you don't have a runtime dependency, but you do have the same uh, development dependencies as off-platform. And on, when you're off platform, you have to run the runtime, the Lightning Web Components runtime, and this is called LWC service. This is something that wraps together all the libraries that help you to transpile and to serve your content. I will talk about these in, in detail just after. Let's, for now, a moment, just take a look at the uh, development dependencies. There are different things that need to be done, testing, limiting, and formatting. So this all, this all happens in a chain, and the Node.js project is the one driving all of these tools and coordinating them. Whether it is on or off platform, this happens on both environments. 
So for the tooling, uh, here I'm gonna give you a list of common tools that you can use. These are the ones that we suggest, and we're also providing some extensions for you to run on uh, Lightning Web Components. The first one is called Jest. This is actually the most uh, used tool to test JavaScript. And it's working with uh, vanilla JavaScript, so meaning JavaScript that runs in your browser with any, without any framework. Now, we are providing an extension to it, SFDX Jest LWCU, that is actually uh, a plugin for the base framework that allows us to test Lightning Web Components. So we're adding a few things for the sp specific syntax of Lightning Web Components. So that is really, really efficient. It works well. It's also very well documented. So the Jest site has a huge community. And the good news is that most of the testing patterns already exist before we had Lightning Web Components because it is being used to test React, Angular, all of the other frameworks. And the testing, the, right, the code you write for testing is, that, is exactly the same. This is what you get when you work with standards. You're working with tools from other communities and you're working with documentation from other communities. So you don't have to rewrite all of this. The next tool that I want to introduce to you is called linting. It's actually ESLint. So linting, for those of you who are not familiar with that word, is actually making sure your code adheres to a certain level of standards. So for example, you do not have um, unused variables, or you are um, not accessing something that hasn't been declared, or that um, maybe you don't have a return statement in a function. So these things, there are a certain set of rules, and ESLint is very good at that. There are hundreds of rules that you can configure. Some of them are activated by default, some can be disabled. And that's actually especially important when you work in a team to make sure that you follow the same rules. So the project manager can decide on a set of rules that everyone must, must adhere to, and you can run some scripts that will prevent people from pushing to any source control if they don't have these rules uh, matched in their code. So just like Jest, we also have a plugin for that, it's called ESLink config LWC, which adds a few rules to the base components that are specific to Lightning Web Components. So for example, um, in Lightning Web Components, you cannot uh, access an identifier on a component. The reason why this is is that the identifiers are regenerated by the framework, so you cannot expect to have an ID with a specific value. So there will be a ESLint rule that will tell you if you're trying to do a get element by ID, that will tell you, oh, if you're not allowed to do that, you shouldn't do it. It's just, just an example. The next tool is for formatting. So same thing, if you work on a team and you have multiple developers that don't have the same coding style, the code, is, the code base is gonna look very uh, inconsistent. What we can do actually to make things better is to use something like Preacher, and Preacher will actually reformat your code for you. So for example, if you're used to put a, a, a bracket and line return or before the line return, you can decide on those rules and Preacher will enforce that for everyone. So that's pretty convenient. And then, <coughs> sorry, and then you can use any other tool supported by Node.js. There are thousands of libraries that you, that you can build and use. These are just the ones that are providing out of the box. Now, all of these dependencies are actually absolutely optional. You can remove them, you can replace them with your own. There is no constraint to, to, for using them. These are only on your development environment. They're not being shipped to production. Now, I'm gonna show you a quick demo of how we can create a new Lightning Web Components project. So I'm gonna shift to another view here. And what I'm looking at here is the Lightning Web Components open source website. So I'm gonna create a quick, um, a quick project. The URL of the site is lwc.dev, but I will show you that in the resources later. So what I'm gonna show you right now is this, the tool here called Create LWC App, which lets us create a new uh, Lightning Web Component open source project. So I'm gonna run a, um, a terminal here, and I'm gonna run that command. So that's npx, that is the node package manager, create lwc dash Sorry, live typing isn't easy. And then I'm gonna call it uh, DF19, for example. So what, that's, what this will do is that it will actually look for the, for the project, fetch the right dependencies, and it will actually run an interactive script which will let me configure my project. And setting up an OJS project can be very painful because there are a lot of configuration that needs to be done at first. With that project, you save a lot of time because it will create a basic template. And then as you, as you grow more comfortable with the platform, you can customize it and expand it for your needs. Um, this is gonna take a bit of time. It looks like the network is not so fast. So I can leave that thing running. And in the meantime, I will show you the project that I have already prepared for you. Oh, actually it's, okay, let's just wait. It looks like it's getting there. So what it's essentially doing is that it's fetching all sorts of dependencies, and now we are in the interactive part of the script. So because I, I already set the, the parameter to my, to my command here, I already have a package name. So npm is the node uh, package manager. So this is like the app exchange for, for node. You can build and share packages there. 
So here I'm gonna take the default name of my app, DF19. I can write the description for the package if I want to publish it later. I'm not gonna do that. The offer name, the version, the license if I want to license this. Then I can also host that on GitHub. So I'm just gonna say, to keep the defaults here for the project name and the repo name. And then I can select a package manager. Uh, Node.js is a bit particular in the sense that it has two different package managers that can help you get or get dependencies. I'm going to keep to the um, I'm going to keep the default de dependency here, the def default package manager called npm. I can also work with uh, TypeScript also if I want or JavaScript. I'll work with JavaScript in my case, and I will create a custom server configuration. Now, once I finish to enter all this information, this is going to create for me the, the project structure. So you see, it's generating all sorts of files with the configuration and um, I'll show you that just when, as it's finished. Now, it's making sure that we are saving the dependencies, and as soon as this finishes, I'm gonna be able to open this. All right, and let's add a bit more time to it. You can see that it's adding a lot of packages. That's the, um, the way Node works, is that it relies on a lot of modular dependencies. Fortunately for you, you don't have to worry about all of this. This is all done by the uh, NPM, the um, Node Package Manager. Now, in a couple seconds, we should be able to start it. I will, in the meantime, I will just jump to one finished project. And actually, that is not the screen I wanted to show you. Let me just open another window. Oh, okay. Never mind, I closed it. Um, all right, let's just open that. Thing here, I'll create, um, I'll open another project. Uh, one second, demo, and I have the completed demo for you. It's uh -huh, installed, there we go. So what I'm doing is here essentially is opening a new uh, Visual Studio Code with the finished project. So this one was already pre-installed just before I, I ran the show. So what we see here is the default project structure here, and there are a bunch of files here which are the configuration files. You can see configuration for the linting tool, configuration for the form, code formatter, and some configuration for the test files here also as well. The most important bit of code here is, uh, configuration, sorry, is here the package JSON. What is really important here is the, um, the script part at the end here. And this is telling us all the commands that are available to be run on this project. So for example, if we want to show this project, I'm going to run a simple command here by accessing a terminal, and I'm going to be able to run my code. So what I can do now is npm run and then watch. And this will actually trigger the uh, interactive mode that will redeploy my code. So right, what it is doing now is it's building my project and it will serve it on my local computer here. So if I open that link, I now have a local running uh, Lightning Web Component application. And you can see this is the sample code that is being displayed here. Um, if I can minimize it, I can show you also the, um, the URL to show you that it's actually running on my, uh, on my computer. Oops. All right, so this is really running on the local machine here, and uh, this is actually the, the code that we have in our small project. So if we inspect that, we'll see the Lightning Web Components here as we go. And you can see our, our components um, in the uh, My App application here. So let's take a look quickly at the, at the code there. Um, here. So what we have essentially in this project scaffolding, we have two, two main folders here in sources. We have the client code and the server code. Now, this, this project that we set up has a custom server attached to it. There's just not much it's doing, it's just having an API, a REST API that's available here. So you can expand this and create your own APIs if you need. But I'm not gonna focus too much on the server side of things, I'm more gonna focus on the Lightning Web Components side of things. So on the client directory, you have your main index page, which is the, the app page, and then you have your Lightning Web Components here. Now, the difference between uh, the uh, on-platform and the off-platform version of Lightning Web Components is that you can actually specify your namespace. If you're on, on the platform and you're not inside a package, the default namespace is C, just like in Aura. So if you were on platform, you would have a C-app. In particular here, you have the ability to use your own namespaces, so you can create whatever name you want. And it's under modules that you'll find your namespaces. So here I have the my, my namespace, and then I have my, uh, my different components. I have two components here that are available, the app component, which is shown by my app, and a subcomponent called greeting that is being displayed under it. Now, this project structure is pretty similar to what you have in, in um, on-platform DX projects. You have the same kind of files there, except you don't have the metadata file. 
So I'm not going to continue too much on this. I'm going to go back to the slide for a minute. Oops. All right. And I will talk a bit more about the tooling. So when you create uh, this project and you want to run it, you're essentially using a library called LWC Services. And LWC Services is actually the, the thing that ties together all the dependencies. It's bringing up for you the framework itself, but it's also bringing some other tools like transpiling tools. And transpiling is essentially the way to convert JavaScript that is running on your computer into something that all browsers can understand. So when, you, when you're working with uh, Lightning Web Components, you're coding with classes, with modules, things that are um, the upcoming standards. But all browsers don't necessarily understand that. So for example, if you want to deploy to, Lightning, to IE 11, you'll have to transpile it. So that's basically a way to convert your code with the latest standard into something that is older that can be understood by all the browsers. And so we use two things in particular, one called Babel and another called Rollup. But these are the tools that will convert your JavaScript into something that is a bit more um, understandable by all browsers. Now, you, there's also the watch mode, which is very interesting because it, it lets you code uh, on one window and maybe, uh, more, I mean, look your com at your component on one window, also redeploy on the others. So if you make changes, your changes are actually deployed live. I will show you that after. I didn't modify my component here, but I, I could have an, a window open with the code and play with the code and refresh automatically my page. The equivalent to that watch mode when you're on platform is called the uh, local development. And this is just pretty new here. When you use uh, this particular Salesforce command, you can actually open a browser that will show you your component. And you can actually code this thing and see it refreshed in real time without having to push it on the org. So open, you're working towards the Salesforce platform, but you are trying to develop, you're developing on, the, on your own computer. So you, it doesn't mean that you're doing it offline, however, because you still have some dependencies to your, so for example, if your component is using any um, Salesforce data, if there are queries, if you have wires or if you need to call REST services on the Salesforce uh, platform, you will still have this dependency, but what we will do is essentially is hide them from you. So you don't have to worry about pushing your code to the org, refreshing the page, etc. You can test it, and the um, dependency to the platform is actually proxied, so it's hidden on your computer, but it's hitting your org behind the scene. Now, there are some limitations. This tool is very new, and so we don't have, it's not complete yet. Things like styling, for example. This component is rendered outside of the context of the Salesforce org in which it should live. So there are a few styling issues there with responsiveness. Another thing that's also um, to take into account when you're working with local development is the fact that you may not receive parameters from parent components. So maybe this component lives in a parent component that passes uh, parameters to it. So that is not something you can do in, in local development. You have to hardcode your parameters just for the time being. We'll work on that uh, later on, but for now you have to hard code the parameter values. Now, the, um, the thing that is interesting also with Flying Web Components is that you have a set of base components, and this has been just announced during the keynote. We just open sourced the Lightning Base Component, and this is a really major announcement because it means that you can now look into the technical implementation of those base components. So think about tiles, buttons, pick lists, et cetera. These are all being open sourced. What we're seeing here uh, in, in this slide here is, uh, is the implementation of the card component. So everyone has probably used a card in the room. And this is how we are uh, serving cards uh, as a base component. So this is a very interesting thing to, to look at. And uh, this is going to evolve. Right now, we don't have all the components yet published as open source. But the idea here is that every component that you can use as part of the base components will be open sourced. There is, however, one slight thing that is really a limitation for now is that you cannot use this, these base components with Lightning Web Component open source. So it is open source, but open source for platform. The reason why it is not supported on the uh, off-platform version of Lightning Web Components is that we still have a lot of dependencies to platform features. For example, things like translations, uh, labels, these are all only available on the Salesforce platform. So we cannot yet take those components out of the platform. It is the team's project goal, I mean, to deploy these components anywhere, but for now they're only supported for on-platform development. Anyway, they're really, they're really interesting to look at, and I think uh, we're gonna see this evolve a lot. And the good news is, is that by open sourcing them, We'll be able to look at the technical details of the implementation, and we'll be able to submit bugs and like tweak those components if needed. Now, the, these components, whether they're built for off-platform or on-platform, can be tested with Jest. 
Jest is, a, is again is a really good tool because it's totally standard. So we've, it's been used over and over again. It's validating millions and millions of lines of code. So it's a very mature tool. And it's also quite flexible as well. So you can test all sorts of different frameworks with that. Now, when you're testing things, uh, whether it's on or off platform, you use exactly the same test code. I'll show you that in the demo after. But the test structure is very identical, whether it's on or off platform. The only thing that is really valuable for the on-platform version with um, Jest is that you have to test in an offline mode. When you're running tests for Lightning Web Component on platform, you're actually testing on your local machine. So that means you're totally isolated from the Salesforce platform. Your components work only in your computer. So they have no access to the Salesforce data, but you can mock that. And that's actually a very good thing because it's a good practice to test this in isolation and not to be um, impacted by uh, things like so-called queries or things like that. You're testing on your local computer. Another interesting aspect of testing for Lightning Web Components is that tests, even if you're testing for on-platform, tests are not deployed to the production. They're not deployed to the Salesforce org. Tests only exist on your local machine. So it's super important that you validate those tests and you save them in a revision control system because we do not push those tests to the platform. So there's no way you can get them back. There's always on your machine. Now, there's also a significant change also for, for, for testing in this particular domain. We do not require code. The reason why there is no code coverage uh, expectation for, for Lightning Web Components is that basically if front-end code fails, it is more a problem of not rendering the, the right UI. This will not generally impact your data. For Apex, it's a whole different story. If your code fails, you're probably going to mess up with your data. So that's why there is no code coverage requirement with Lightning Web Components. But please do test. <laughs> that's not the message. Now, when you want to deploy, whether it's on or off platform, you have different tools. For on platform, of course, that is working with Salesforce DX. But when you're off platform, it's actually a server that you run. And you can essentially run it with any type of platform. You can run it off Heroku, of course, but not only. You can use AWS, Google Cloud, or you can also run that on a Raspberry Pi. The Node.js that we implementation that we provide by default is pretty lightweight. So if you want to try this uh, on your own computer or on an old Raspberry Pi, it's, it's very easy to try. And it's very flexible. Now, with that, I'm going to conclude with a few more um, slides. The idea here is that you can really build some components and share them, deploy them everywhere. If you if you manage the if you if you're careful in picking the right architecture, you can build the same component and deploy into different environment, whether it's on or off platform. But there are certain things you need to be aware of. Mainly, the when you're working off platform, you have to take care of the backend. So it's your job and responsibility to make sure that you have you're exposing APIs to fetch data, for example. And also, it's your job also to make sure that the uh, server is secure. There is no services like that that are exposed when you're off-platform. And finally, if you use base components, well, this is, can be a limitation if you want to take your project from on-platform to off-platform. So that is, for, for now, a limitation. As, open, as the base components uh, are getting open source, this limitation will fade away, and hopefully we'll be able to get the same kind of components on and off-platform. Now, if you want to to explore and deep dive a bit more, I'm going to share some resources here that you can use. And in particular, I want to bring your attention to the sample app gallery. I will show you that uh, in another demo right now. But there is a sample app that is called the um, Recipes. And the idea behind Recipes is that it's a set of small code examples that are very small and very focused on one particular task. For example, there's a little Hello World. There's a little um, input and with a form. Very small code examples, about 30 lines of of code for each. And each of these sample applications, uh, sample recipes, sorry, are actually published in two projects. One is the project for recipes on platform, and there's also another project for recipes that is off platform. So by looking at those two projects, you can compare the behavior of the components, and you can compare the code structure. And you'll see that most of the code is identical. Now, if you want to learn more about Lightning Web Components, we have the Lightning Web Components website, lwc.dev, pretty easy to remember. And if you want to get your hands on, we have uh, built a very interesting uh, trial here on Trailhead that is composed of free projects that will actually take you from going from open source to the platform. So essentially, if you follow this link here, you'll see that the, the first project lets you create a little conference app with Lightning Web Component open source. In the second project, you take that same conference app 
and you put a, um, a server backend that will actually uh, connect with Salesforce data. So you're bringing Salesforce data into an open source project that is running off platform. And the third and final project lets you take that whole app that you've built on open source off platform and bring it over on the platform. So you can see the journey between the off platform version to the platform. And you'll see that the code changes are not that uh, significant. With that, I'm going to show you the rest of this application and show you an example of that. So I have in one of my windows here, oh, sorry. Yeah, here it is. I have in one of my windows the um, sample gallery website, and you can see the two top uh, uh, items here are the recipes and the recipes open source. So I'm going to jump to that, and I'm going to show you an example of one of those components. So I'm going to take uh, this one, for example, which is conditional rendering. It's very simple. This little card here is recipe. So for example, it just shows me the behavior of when I click, how do I refresh the UI to deal with that click. So it's a very simple example, and you can click here to view the source code, so you see that it's very simple. There's just a couple of lines of code, and it's just covering a basic use case. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this component, and I'm gonna transfer it to the, um, to the project that I have running here on my local machine. And you'll see that we have very little to do to make this run on the off-platform version. So I'm gonna go now switch to my code editor, and this is, um, this is where I'll, I'll bring in the recipe code. So this is my component. This is the hello conditional component. So I'm just going to copy it. This is the off on platform version. I'm going to copy this folder, and I'm going to bring it over to my second project, which is the off platform version. So I'm just going to dump it in my, um, my components here. And the only thing that I have to do is now use my component. So instead of my app, I can directly call my hello uh, dash conditional Uh, what is it? Conditional rendering, I think. Yeah, conditional rendering. Ah, tag here, and I'll make sure that I have the right closing tag. And now, as I'm going to save, I'm going to make sure that I have the two windows open side by side so you get a chance to see the live um, deployment. So this is my code. Oops. This is my code, and this is the app that is running right now. So I'm going to make sure that I can show you both at the same time here. And when I'm saving, I'm going to redeploy this thing. So I'm going to save my file here, and this will refresh the window behind me. This is the watch mode that I was talking you, to you about. So right now, there's something that is broken, I guess. Uh, it's not showing up, but we'll, fi we'll figure out what this is. All right. OK, maybe the refresh didn't work. Aha, mystery, mystery. So what we should see here is the conditional rendering component. Uh, oh, but I left some base components. OK, that's not going to help. So that's the problem I mentioned earlier. If you have base components in here, that, that won't work. So I'm just going to change that um, to a, actually to an input, and that will work uh, as well. I'm going to remove the card, get rid of the base component, and that will be the end demo. All right. If I remove all the base components and the other dependencies, that will work fine. Oh, sorry, I, I, it's not working. Well, anyway, you, you get the idea here. And the idea is that now that I'm uh, running this component on my local machine, I can run the test in the same way. The, the test files are actually exactly the same structure, so I could run my local test and figure out what is wrong with my configuration. So the idea is that you can really drag and drop those components between on and off platform as, sure, as long as you make sure that you don't have those base components in there. And that's what I had for you today. I hope you learned a few things, and I hope you had a really good Dreamforce. I'd like to thank you again for attending, and I hope to see you soon again. Thank you.